I am Mrs. Frank R. Samus, Academy Hill, Stratford. I have been curator in January. It'll be 30 years of this house. Mr. Boo has taken it over this year in July. I'd like to tell you that the first house built in Stratford was built on this lot, a stone house two stories high. William Judson, his wife, and three sons occupied it. Then his great-grandson, that was 1639, his great-grandson took the stones from the stone house and built the foundation for this house, which was built in 1723, which was given to us in 1926. We opened it as a historical society home, showing it as a colonial home, not as a museum. I don't know where to go on from this, but of course, when David Judson built this house in 23, he gave one third of this green, called the Common Green, to the town of Stratford as a donation to the town. He lived here and had many children who married into all the attractive old families in the town. How long ago was that, Mrs. Samuels? 1723 this house was built. David was married and lived here. And his daughter Sarah married Stephen Curtis, who was the great-grandfather of Senior Canelia who presented this house to us. At that time, were there any recollections or were they told any stories about any Indians and where they lived near this area? Well, when Stratford was settled in 1639, there were 17 families came to Stratford in the eight, uh, 17... Early 1700, we had a watch house on Academy Hill, which shows to protect the town from the New York Dutch and the native Indians. This watch house had a secret passage which went from the flagpole into this cellar so that they could go in and out without being molested. Then in 1805, the Stratford Academy was built on the Hill, here where the monument is, in memory of the Civil War veterans. But before that, our first Congregational Church was built on the corner of Elm Street and uh, Shaw Road or South Avenue, and that they outgrew. It was a log cabin house. They outgrew that, came up to uh, Academy Hill on the southeast corner, and built a house there, and there's where we had a drum to call the people to church. That soon, in that was uh, built in 1689, and they outgrew that and drew and uh, built a church where the monument now stands. And that was struck by lightning and burned up. At that time, Whitfield came here from Guilford and preached that wonderful sermon, which was heard for miles around. His voice was so strong. Then after that, the next Congregational Church was built up where the, the present Congregational States are. Uh, we've had three Episcopal Churches and five Congregational Churches. The first Episcopal Church was down where the graveyard is at the foot of the hill, the second and third up in this locality here. About this Main Street, how, did it extend all the way down in your Main own Street mind? was ten, yard, ten miles long. It went from the shoreline to Derby. And, uh, of course, that was all our business street then. But all the early settlement was down in Lower Elm Street and Lower Main Street, mostly. Many old families, of course, all the old histories have complete records of those. When did the business establishments begin to move up towards that end? The, toward Paradise Green? Or, well, towards the center where they are now, near the railroad station. Well, I presume that was the, the uh, 
business part of the that town. Has been the business I think part. so. Of course, there's very little business in uh, Stratford at that time. They were mostly farmers and shipbuilders and things like that. We had a very important man who lived down Elm Street with the same uh, Captain Matthias Nichols. He owned a thousand acres of land up in Nichols Town, which was part of Stratford at that time, and used to ride up and down on uh, the, uh, the road to Nichols, and they called it the Captain's Highway because he went horseback there every day to look at his farm. He was a shipbuilder, and he built a very wonderful ships that went between England and Stratford. This was a great seaport until 1850, and the historical house is, has many, many, many things that were brought back by the sea captains from well, all over. Down in the harbor, the Max Harbor was a, a little gut that came in from the Sound, uh, from the Hustonic River. And, uh, of course, all this harbor was open, where Bedell Shipyard and John Bond's Dock and so on down. Matthias Nichols lived on Elm Street in an old house that was built there in 1775 for him, and he bought, made, built beautiful houses for his daughters. He had four daughters. One of them was the, the rest home of, home of uh, F.C. Beach on Elm Street, and uh, one was the home that the Shakespeare's had bought for a school, and uh, one was the big beautiful house on Academy Hill with two porches on, and one Aaron, Colonel Aaron Benjamin married and built over on West Broad Street. He was a very famous man. And he took uh, Robert Johnson to England to sell $250,000, a uh, acres to England for 25 cents an acre, which was located in North Carolina. By that now. <laughs> uh, speaking of the boundaries, you mentioned that Nichols belonged to Stratford. How about the uh, west side? Now, when Stratford was settled, it went from here to Derby, which was 10 miles. It took in Huntington and Trumbull, and we went way over to uh, Park Avenue in Bridgeport, and then Fairfield took over for the town of Fairfield. We have about the same population now, each of us. In the early times, as early as 1698, they set off a part of Bridgeport and a part of Stratford and called it Stratfield, which is now in existence in West Bridgeport. In 1808, I think, they began to talk about taking a piece of Stratford and a piece of Bridgeport, a piece of Stratford and a piece of uh, Fairfield, and call it Bridgeport. And that is over a hundred years old now. The dividing line was Park Avenue and Bridgeport between the two places. When we had a place called Newfield that went way over mm -hmm. to Yellow Mill Bridge at one time. And in 1887, we sold our land that went from Yellow Mill Bridge over to Bruce Pond by the Catholic Cemetery. That means that that uh, place where Central High School is now, the, uh, the Pequonic Hill, where the Indians lived, that belonged to Stratford originally. You know about the Main Street section in Bridgeport? We owned way over... Pen to Pembroke Lake. You know where that is? Pembroke Lake. Well, I don't think they call it Pembroke Lake now. It, it, oh, I'm... Is there any way to shut this off? Yes. It came from England. And most of our early settlers came from England. My ancestors came from France to England to Boston to Stratford, and most of our old family are English people, and we have their generations back for 11 more generations, Stratford people. Do you know why they came? 
Yes, on account of their religion. They came here for freedom. And they came first to Boston and then down to Stratford. Well, they didn't all come from Boston. Of course, the very first people came to Plymouth, Massachusetts. My family came to Boston. How did these first people earn a living here? Well, they had farms mostly, and they had stocks, and they, some of them were lawyers, and some were ministers, some were farmers. They had great many acres of peace, you know, raised cattle, and they were shipbuilders, and they were millers. We had mills to to make woolen clothes, and they had spun clothes, and they made shoes. We sent a good many shoemakers down south after the Civil War. We sent clock makers, chair makers, and uh, carpenters out to Ohio when Ohio was settled. That's a little over a hundred years ago. Do you know anything about the first schools here? The what? The first schools here? Yes, I, uh, when, I, when I was a girl, we had uh, what we called district schools. We had one at Orono, one at Putney, one at Paradise Green, one up at uh, North Parade where the high school is now in that section. One down by the sh horse sheds, that's near the Congregational Church, where the Red Men's Hall is. One on uh, White Street called Sedgwick Street. And one at Sandy Hollow called uh, Sandy Hollow School. We had it, one at Newfield and one at, at mm, Old Mill Green. I think we had about 11 schools. And of course, then that was all dissolved, and we went into a grade school in 1886, I think. And uh, now we've branched all out again, schools all over the town. Um, when, how far did you go to school? You know, back when? How long, how many years of school did they have in grade school, in the district school? Well, I should think about eight years. Eight years. I personally wouldn't know, for I never went to a public school. But my children, I'm sure, went in to a private school first when they were two and a half and three and a half years old, and then when they were five years old, went to the grade school. Witchcraft in, those, uh, in the early times. Witchcraft? Yeah. Witchcraft. Oh, we hanged one witch over at Gallows Brook. And when I was a child, over at the corner of what is now Linden Avenue, West Broad Street, were beautiful rocks. And on the rocks are uh, great claw marks where the witch that was hanged clawed into the rock to to prevent their taking her to be hanged. Do you, uh, do you know why they, they accused her of being a witch? Well, I couldn't tell the exact things, but if you read witchcraft, you will know why they took all of them, especially at Salem in Massachusetts. That was the where they committed the greatest sins up there. Getting back to the schools, Mrs. Samus, when were the first high schools built in Stratford? Our first grade school was is 1885 or 6. The old center school here had a high school in the 1880s and 1890s, didn't it? Well, I, everything was taught in that one school, if that's oh, what you mean. High school and elementary school. Yes. Yeah. Now, my children graduated in this school, and my son went to Yale in uh, 19... He graduated the first time in 1909. That was three years' course. Then he went back and graduated in 1911. That was two years more, five years at Yale. 
Did they have any private schools in Stratford? Oh, a great many. Mr. Booth has a list of all those schools. I wrote out a paper, Mr. Booth might show you that, that gives all the private schools from Arnold down all over town and, and all the public schools, see? Could you tell us anything about the Stratford knockings at all? When I was a young girl, Professor Sedgwick was the man who taught school for 50 years here in Stratford, had a very fine private school after he retired from the academy. And Professor Sedgwick and Mr. Fred Beardsley, who was the first town select man, went down to Mr. Fred Beach's house, which was then owned by a Phelps family, and uh, to watch for these knockings. They were written up. We have a description of them in the library of what they did. It seems that uh, these two men were sat in the dining room and they put silver spoons on the closet shelves and shut the door. And when they would open the door, the spoons would be open, broken in part. And they said they would sit in there quietly and pillows would come running down the front stairs over and over. And then the, go to across the floor and the carpets would raise up in the floor and trip them up. Now these are both honorable, reliable citizens and they spent much time there trying to find out. They afterwards found that somebody lived there who didn't want to live there and the children were playing all these pranks in order to make their mother move out of town. And then after that, Mr. Fred Beach, who was the head of the Scientific American in New York City, lived there and traveled back and forth every day to business. They had no more ghosts after that family moved on. Could you tell us something about the ferry? The ferry? Mm -hmm. Well, first place, we had nothing but a ferry across the river. Now, Moses Wheeler was born in 1698. He lived to be a hundred years old, and his gravestone says 1800, but he was the first man in Connecticut to live to be a hundred years old. He was a carpenter and lived in Milford, and he came home one Sunday afternoon to uh, and kissed his wife, and it was a blue law. And because he kissed her, he had to swim across the Houstonic River and come over to the Stratford shore, and he never went back. They moved over here, and he got a charter from the General Assembly that he should run a ferry across the Houstonic River. And Howard Wilcox's book has a picture of the ferry boat going across to Milford shore. Did they allow husbands to kiss their wives in Stratford? Is that why he moved to Stratford? Um, perhaps so. I wouldn't know that. <laughs> but I do know this, that our first bridge was built in 1805, and up in our attic we have a hair trunk, they call them. They were sometimes made of colt skin and calf skin and any kind of hairy things. It was made out of a trunk of a tree, hollowed out like they would hollow out a canoe and uh, it had a lid and it was covered with this and brass nails and very ornate and it was sent to me from North Carolina because this lady's father built the first bridge in 1805 across the Houstonic River and he had this to carry his tools from New York City up to Stratford once a weekend. We've had five Houstonic River bridges so far. Were the bridges in about the same place yes, as this uh, one is yes. now? They will, of course, keep the old bridge until the new one was located and then tear down the first one for the second one. Is that the same place the ferry was where the bridge is now? Yes. And, uh, and uh, Moses Wheeler's first house was on the corner of uh, East Main Street and Ferry Boulevard opposite the Ray Bester's factory on that corner lot. And D.M. Reed bought it in my day and blew it up to get rid of it. The second Moses Wheeler house was the little red house right next to Ray Bester's, 
And the third Moses Wheeler house is in Putney, opposite the Putney Cemetery. One of the Moses Wheelers ran a mill up at Putney called the Farm Mill River Mill. What recollections do you have of the first factories or industries coming into Stratford? To my knowledge, uh, uh, the first what we would call a factory was the hoop skirt factory in uh, Booth's Block, which is now called Reed's Block, by the railroad track corner of Linden Avenue and Main Street Center. It's been turned around, made into stores and rents now. But at my girlhood, they made hoop skirts there. And when hoop skirts were, of course, very fashionable during the middle of 1800, and after they went out of fashion, they made ladies' bustles. After that, it was turned into a meat market and grocery store business and rents upstairs. That was the first factory I ever heard of. The next thing I ever knew of was a paper mill, paper bag factory, which was in the old Stratford post office, which was 1805, and stood where the Bontown Fish Market stands now on Main Street. The old post office was moved in back and used as a paper bag factory, and they employed girls there to make paper bags. Of course, we had many shops like saddler shops and, and uh, boot and shoe shops and things like that all over town. On Longbrook Avenue, we had a comb factory made in 1800, and all the tortoise shell came from the south. And this man, his name was Booth, and he made shell combs. And we also had a shell factory in my neighborhood where I lived, and there they made napkin rings and cuff buttons and buttons to sew on and combs and the back combs and comb to comb your hair, all that kind. That was in my day. That was in the 70s. Was it in your days that they put up the first railroad station here and the trains? Do you recall much of that? The, ra the railroad went through before I was born. I was born in 61. The railroad went through in 53. My mother and father walked down to the track to see the first train go to New Haven in 53. Our first station here, we have a picture of it in the hall, which is very interesting, and we've had three stations. The first one was uh, near the Red House on Linden Avenue, the railroad was not, of course, raised. There was a little footbridge went over Tanner's Brook, over into King Street and Broadbridge Road. The, the, when the ra railroad was raised, our old railroad was brought up on the right-hand side of Main Street as you go up town, where it is standing now. But the, the, we had another railroad on the north side of the railroad track, which I don't know whether it's been torn down or not. They want to sell it. Do you have recollections of the first automobiles coming to Stratford? The first automobile that came into Stratford came to my house after 1900. A man from Long Island and his wife. And we had many guests in our house. And he took each individual guest and took them out for a ride all around town. He afterwards was killed on the railroad track in his automobile, he and his wife both. Remember uh, what kind of an automobile it was? The no, I do not, but I know our first automobile was a Cadillac, a one-lunger with five passenger seats, and the back of the car let down and let a little step down, and you got in the back and shut the door, and that made the fifth seat, see? That was 18, 1908. They called it the one-lunger? One-lunger. That mean one cylinder? One cylinder. <laughs> How were the roads in those days? Like all, dirt, roads. all dirt roads. When I was a little girl, the road from here into Fairfield would be mud up to the hubs, perhaps. And I remember when I was a little girl going over uh, what they call Swamp Lane, uh, Lane is now South Avenue. It was nothing but swamps and trees and check, uh, chestnut and walnut trees, beautiful spot for birds and everything. 
and uh, we went in, and where the Catholic cemetery is now was a farm, and the man made wheelbarrows and failed, and his whole fence, for I should think 200 feet, was nothing but wheelbarrow handles. What about the post road? How was that? Was that always a pretty muddy What we call a post road came over Old Mill Hill, down West Broad Street that way, went over Ferry Boulevard, you know, to the ferry. That was, of course, that was, I remember when Barnum Avenue was made and they ballasted it with old tree trunks and limbs and things like that and built it up and there wasn't one bit of sidewalk, no good road, not a light on Barnum Avenue from my house anywhere. There's not a sidewalk. Uh, Mrs. Samus, in the way of recreation, movies and plays, what did they have in your own lifetime that you recall? The only thing we had was homemade plays and charades and thing, house parties. We had no theaters, you know. Then the new Strat the Stratford Theater is a latecomer here. I think Mr. Pickett was the first man that had a theater in Stratford. Do you know any stories about this house? Or could you tell us something about the way the house is laid out that would help us describe the uh, life of the early settlers here? Perhaps? Well, when William came, he came with his wife and family, and they had slaves who cooked in the mm -hmm. first cellar which we call the slave quarters, and they had a building outside. Most slaves slept in separate buildings in olden times. And we have a, a slave's bandana downstairs and a slave's pair of spectacles. And when, oh, I guess I'm not talking this. Sorry, I'm trying to say, yeah. Um, um, when Abner Judson died in 1774, he left uh, a thousand dollars worth of slaves. A man slave was worth sixty pounds, and a woman forty pounds, and a child would be perhaps as low as five pounds, which would be five dollars. He, the slaves' names are all on that list downstairs, and the price of each one. We know that there was a kitchen downstairs. They do all the uh, cooking. All the cooking. Downstairs? This kitchen in the fireplace behind was not a cooking kitchen. In olden times, they always had a borning room where all the babies had to be born on the first floor to be near a fireplace. When this house was built, there were no stoves. There were six fireplaces in the house. The one in the kitchen has no crane showing they did not cook there, but they have an oven where they could cook surplus food. Would the slaves cook in the basement and then bring the things upstairs? Yes. And they ate in the kitchen? Yes. Right. We also know, notice the bars on the, um, on the windows down there, too. Right? Well, that was to keep the Indians out. And on the doors, all the doors, the door downstairs is the door of the first house, 1639, the one in the cellar way. And all the doors in the cellar and up here had uh, shutters inside and glass window. And you could bring the shutter down a little way and peek out and see if there was an Indian and put the shutter up again, see? You didn't have to open the door without you wanted to. Did they have much trouble with the Indians at first? No, our Stratford Indians were very friendly. We had no... I think the worst fight we had at all was over in Fairfield in the swamp fight. But I never have heard anything about Stratford being bad. So it was mostly a precaution they had. That it yes. actually wasn't based on anything. You never had any trouble. No, it never had any trouble. When I was a little girl, 12 years old, we had Indians that came to Stratford every summer and camped out on what is called Johnson Avenue. That was Deacon Curtis, Deacon Edgar Curtis's lane. And they had, uh, they slept up there, and they had a great flat rock for a table, and used to make outside fires. And they made um, baskets. We have uh, over 70 baskets in this house, either made by the Indians or brought in by the sea captains from the different ports. These Indians told fortunes, 
and they would come and tell your fortune for a head of cabbage and a piece of salt pork. Uh, Mrs. Sanders, in your lifetime, you've seen the women change clothes. Mm -hmm. Comment a bit on, during your own lifetime on the different styles and clothes that the women have worn, and your own opinion. Well, I think the most adorable clothes that I know anything about were in the middle 1800s, from 1835 up. With the big hoop skirts and the full skirts. Mr. Booth ought to show you that eleven, uh, that beautiful yellow satin skirt, so you'll see how full and lovely they were. That was again ninety dress, though, but not early enough. Uh, earlier, uh, we had when I was fourteen years old. I wore dresses down, touched the ground, and uh, you know we used to trail them in the dirt and get them all soused up. How did you, the uh, young women react to the changes in clothes when the... Well, I guess they were just as keen for change as they are now. <laughs> <laughs> but we have many, many photographs and, and uh, daguerreotypes, about 50, that would have old-fashioned clothes on, and some of the most adorable poke bonnets. We have 40 bonnets in this house, all periods, from 1835 up. This was the real dining room always, and that corner closet was born in the room. This one was a reproduction in 1885. Is this the size of most houses at that time? Or well, uh, the better the better class of people built houses. This, say, and of course, the poorer people built houses with with uh, salt box houses. They called them, which were a ro uh, room a floor and a half in order when Anne was a queen in 1717 on up. She taxed us, you see, for all our buildings, and if it was two stories, the tax was much higher. So they put up the bluff of having a one-story house with a lean-to, which didn't increase the taxes. My father coming home from the Civil War, I guess. <laughs> um, how long had he been in the Civil War? I was born December of 61, and he went the spring of 62. He was in the Battle of Gettysburg. He was wounded. He was prisoner in Andersonville Prison. He was Provost Marshal. He was a captain, and he stayed till the war was over. Oh, he came home as soon as the war was over, and in, uh, when I was four and a half years old, we came over to Stratford to live. It, I was born on Old Mill Hill, which was Stratford then, and we came over here and bought a house when I was a little girl. I've been brought up right in the middle of the town since then. So you've really seen all the changes in Stratford for quite a while now? How, how did you feel when they started building up stores up in the green like now they they're really building up the green more than they did this old part of town i feel terribly about stratford changing so when i was little there were great many aristocrats came to stratford and lived in this section of and went to new york for business all the time now you see we've got everything factories and everything and everything has changed we don't have any people here with money in Stratford anymore, of any consequence. First place, a good many of our money people moved over to Fairfield. We have an entirely different population we used to have. Did those businessmen commute to New York every day? Yes. Every day. After the railroad came. I don't know what they did before that. But Ezra Wheeler, who was a rich man in Stratford, was lived in Stratford, and... Uh, of course, he was one of the suppliers of food for the war, and his business was in Bridgeport, and he lived here. That was in the 60s. Do you have recollections of any personalities 
political or otherwise coming to Stratford, visiting here? Presidents or? Well, Abraham Lincoln came to Bridgeport, and I, I know one of our neighbors went over to see him there, and he sat in a red velvet chair, and one time we had a, a Lincoln exhibit here in the house with a Civil War exhibit, and uh, we borrowed that red chair and had it here on exhibition part of a week. Uh, of course, we have had a great many very remarkable people in Stratford. Uh, William Samuel Johnson was the most famous man in Connecticut, and he was the one that formed the Constitution. Mr. Booth could tell you better than I can about that. He's just written a, a paper on him. Yes. What part did Stratford play in the Revolutionary War? Was there much revolting here? Well, we had some tourists who lived at the top of Huntington Road who went to Canada during this, uh, this, the uh, Revolutionary War. But we had a great many Revolutionary soldiers. We have a list in... Um, upstairs of all the people that went from Stratford to the Revolutionary War. But of course there were a great many people helped with the war by furnishing uh, cheese and all kinds of food supplies for Washington's army. There was never any actual fighting around here? Not during the Revolutionary War. We had uh, Revolutionary soldiers as high up as Old Mill Hill, that's where the Bridgeport Hospital is, and the Bourne Fairfield, you know. This uh, Mrs. Mitchell that died had a great, great, great grandmother whom the revolutionary soldiers went into an old salt box house over where the General Electric factory is now, and they took the bedding off the clothes and emptied all the bureau drawers into this bedding and all the food and everything. And one of her great-grandmother had just woven some beautiful woolen blue yarn to make a bed quilt out of. And she lay down that in her trundle bed and saw them demolish everything in the house. And when they got ready to go out of the house, they said, Here, old man, are your britches. There's nothing left for you to eat in the house. You'll have to go out and beg your breakfast. Were these British soldiers? Or Those are British soldiers. Speaking of these wars, did the War of 1898 have any effect on Stratford, our short 1898 war? Well, now, was that the Spanish War? The Spanish-American hmm. War. Well, we had some people that went to that war, but I wouldn't know who they were. I remember the war. It didn't have much of an effect on the town, because... I should not think so. I uh, have lived through five wars. Uh, speaking, uh, you've had a long life, Mrs. Sanders. Uh, we recently had these floods. Do you remember, do you recall any catastrophes that hit the town, floods or storms that are outstanding in your mind? I think not. I think they said this Connecticut flood was the worst one since Noah's flood in the Bible. Yeah. I do know this, that we had trouble with ice in the river and many times uh, very dangerous states of the uh, bridges, you know, being piled up with ice. But strange to say, I don't believe that the water in the Hustonic River froze over last year, and that was the year of what, 54. Uh, to end this, if we're ready to end it, could you give us your age? I would be 94 the 8th day of December nine, this year. Always lived in Stratford. Always lived in Stratford. Imagine you like Stratford. I love every inch of Stratford. I think it's beautiful. I love Stratford people, and I know hundreds of them. I counted up the other night, 500 of people I've known have died since I can remember on the, in the Stratford main road, 500 people. I just want to tell you that my great grandfather Bowden. Can we hear this too? If you want to. Yes. I don't think I better. It's too personal.
Stratford was settled in 1690 or 39 by the Reverend Adam Blakeman and a small band of settlers. But the territory was visited by Captain Mason and his men while pursuing the Pequot Indians to Sasco Swamp, while the great swamp fight ended the Pequot War in 1637. Soldiers from Stratford took part in King Philip's War in 1675. The first Episcopal Church in Connecticut was established in Stratford in 1707. Dr. Samuel Johnson, the first rector in 1723, was the first president of King's College, now Columbia University. Stratford was the largest town in Fairfield County in 1775 and did her full share in the Revolutionary War, was visited by Washington in April 21, 1775. Washington and Lafayette met in Stratford September 19, 1780. Washington visited Stratford again in 1789, and Lafayette visited Stratford again in 1824. William Samuel Johnson, member of the First Continental uh, Constitutional Congress Convention, and one of the committee who drafted the Constitution, and the first president of Columbia University, was born in Stratford in 1727. General David Worcester, first major general of Continental troops and Brigadier General of the Continental Army was born in Stratford in 1710. Captain Nickel, with the privateers Scourge and Rattlesnake, had part in capturing and annoying the enemy trade and commerce in the War of 1812. Gideon Tomlinson, representative in Congress, 1819 to 27, Governor of Connecticut, 1827 to 31, United States Senator, 1831 to 37, was born in Stratford in 1780. Da David Plant, Lieutenant Governor from 1823 to 27, was born in Stratford in 1783. Stratford's sons were engaged in almost every important battle of the Civil War. The Home Guards, organized in 1836 as Company K, 8th Regiment, Connecticut Volunt uh, National Guard, continued active for more than 30 years. Transferred to Bridgeport in 1892, became later known as Battery B, and was mustered into federal service for service in the Spanish-American War. Stratford did its full share in the First and Second World Wars. Honorable Raven Baldwin, Governor of Connecticut, United States Senator, and now Justice of Connecticut Supreme Court, resided in Stratford. The Honorable Archibald D. Fowler, former Lord Mayor of Stratford-on-Avon, England, visited Stratford on the Housatonic, April 8, 1927. Today, Stratford is the home of the American Shakespeare Festival Theater and Academy. Stratford is also the home of the new multi-million dollar Sikorsky Aircraft Factory. Can you give us your name, your position, and age? Frederick C. Booth, curator of the Judson House, age 74. Thank you. Okay.